Hi Judith and how are you? Uh, this is uh, Christopher Magona, the Livestock Specialist for National Crow. Thank you very much uh, uh, for giving us this opportunity to share with you, you know, um, uh, what pen fattening entails, the, the dynamics as well as uh, what we are doing as a uh, national crop. So pen fattening basically it's, it's a management system uh, of uh, beef cattle, especially where you are getting them into uh, pens, which is sort of like a confinement and you are giving them feed uh, day, every day. Uh, they are not grazing, they are not walking to anywhere. All they are doing is they are just uh, feeding on high energy, high protein, balanced diet uh, for a period normally not exceeding 90 days. So what you're trying to do there is you're improving uh, the, 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 the average uh, weight gain, which is basically we are improving the weight gain or the rate of gains and also improving the quality of meat, uh, the grades. Uh, so when the animals now are sold from the feedlot, we expect that they must have gained a lot of weight and they have must also have improved in terms of the quality of meat. This then enables the farmers to even get, up, get better prices when they're selling the animals to the abattoirs and so on. So this um, pen fattening basically entails a management system where you're trying to, you know, aggregate animals. Normally it's an aggregation point where you can uh, bring all together all those animals, especially of the ages ranging between 1.5 years to 3 years. In most cases, it's your steers, which is your castrated male animals. And you are able to, you know, improve uh, their grade, the grade of meat, and increase uh, uh, the gain, weight gain, in a small piece of land. So number one, it's, it's an efficient system in terms of land because you are able to fit in actually quite a huge number of animals on a small piece uh, of land. Uh, and also, it's, it's a process that allows the manager or the owner to interact closely with the animals. You seeing the animals daily in the pens giving them what they want, uh, and it's sometimes it's even labor efficient because there is no need for people to be you not know, taking the animals to the grazing and stuff like that. So it's, 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 it's a smarter uh, a production system where you are basically, you can get animals into the feedlot probably from your head or you can be buying from uh, the farmers who are just uh, raising their animals in the rangelands. And like I said, you're targeting normally to bring in animals that are relatively young, uh, of the ages between 1.5 to uh, 3 years. Why? Because when the animals are too old, like 6 years old, uh, it's difficult to give, uh, to improve the meat quality because they are old. Whilst when the animals are also still too young, it's difficult to get a bit more from them because they still uh, want feed or energy for growth and so so you would not get as much weight gain as you would want for uh, young animals. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> looking at the current livestock uh, situation in Zimbabwe, we are faced now with a drought. And uh, pen fattening is one that, you know, production system that farmers can adopt now. Why? Because under this system, you have control over what you are giving to the animals. So you can buy uh, all your feed ingredients, put them aside. You can formulate feed on your own. You are better able to say, okay, uh, how much feed do I need to feed my animals? Then you look for the ingredients and you feed your animals. Then you check your animals. Actually, it allows you to know that I will be able to take my animals after this um, period and so so unlike uh, having to let your animals into the grazing lands that are especially now depleted and that they will be seriously depleted as uh, a drought progresses, uh, pen fattening becomes one way that farmers can actually make use of uh, and they get value out of their animals. Normally when we are under drought situations like we are in Zim now, uh, it's difficult for farmers to you know take care of their animals. The animals normally are in bad shape because they uh, there is little feed. But with the pen fattening, you can actually aggregate these animals and give them uh, the, the, give them feed in confinement. And uh, <clears throat> of course, the profitability is determined largely by how much are you able to get feed. 
uh, cheaply or efficiently. So, but then it gives uh, farmers flexibility to be able to be moving around, you know, looking for the different feed ingredients. Uh, sometimes you can buy the feed from uh, the feed companies or you can formulate feed on your own. The good thing with pen fattening, especially under these such drought conditions, is that you don't keep animals for long. Normally farmers struggle when there is a drought because you are having to keep an animal, say probably for the whole year, you want to be looking for feed, to feed the animals for the whole year, and if there are many, it becomes a challenge. So with pen fattening, you know that it's uh, within a period of three months, you can put together feed ingredients, feed your animals, and the animals are ready to go to the market. It allows the farmers to be able to plan accordingly you can uh, plan your feed and say, by this time, I can mobilize this so much amount of feed. During this time, I do not have feed. So you're able to say, at this time, I'm feeding this so number of animals. Uh, you leave some. You are able to respond effectively to the market demands um, with pen fattening. So it's a very, it's a very strategic uh, component of the livestock value chain. Uh, although very tricky because uh, most farmers are not aware about the technicalities of uh, doing it, but it's a very efficient, land, uh, efficient, labor efficient, and uh, you are able to circulate money within a very short space uh, of time with uh, with feedlot uh, uh, or feedlotting. Now, uh, feedlot uh, now plays a very uh, critical role uh, in the development of the beef industry, particularly in Zimbabwe. Why? Because the bulk of the meat we see uh, in the butcheries from the upper tours is meat of the animals that would have gone through uh, uh, the feedlots or pen fattening. So it's some sort of an aggregation point where all the animals that are raised by people from different areas are sort of like aggregated and from the feedlot the the animals go straight to you know where we get now feed uh beef it means if we are even to look for uh exploring probably export markets and uh for 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 the beef uh, one thing that we need to look at is the potential of the feedlots we have or how uh, technically equipped are we to be very intensive and to produce a large number of animals that come from uh, from the feedlots? So feedlots uh, play a very critical role as a, a last point from which we get uh, uh, from which we get uh, meat. When we are projecting in terms of as a country how much beef are we able to produce per month per year or so, we're basically looking at the animals that we can. Uh, take into feedlots and the animals that can come from feedlots directly into uh, into our abattoirs. It is also very important because with feedlots, it's a point at which we are able to, you know, improve the quality of meat. We are able to sort of like, you know, uh, push uh, the meat we are producing uh, towards what the market uh, we are supplying the meat is expecting. So with, uh, with feedlotting, we are able to, you know, get uh, the nitty gritties of what uh, the market is looking for and we are able to you know uh, push our animals to exactly meet uh, the market requirements so that becomes very very important uh, as a country say we are looking at exporting our uh, beef meat normally the standards are are too high for 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 export markets and it's very difficult for just the livestock farmers distributed across all over to be able to meet uh or to produce their animals in a manner that they meet uh, market standards but if the animals go via feed lotters all you are doing there is concentrating on feeding the animals in a manner that when they come out of the feed lots, they are now you know going uh, they're going straight to them uh, to the upper tours and uh, that's beef now so it becomes very very uh very very important because uh from the feedlots that's where we realize actually all the money that's generated by livestock especially beef animals uh, per se uh that's where we also are graded as a country in terms of what's the quality of meat when they say the quality of meat we get probably from zimbabwe is very good or is bad. Normally, it talks to what the market is getting from them, uh, from the feedlots. 
it is from the feedlots uh, that we are able to, to determine the quantities of meat we can produce as a country or as farmers. So it's that point of the value chain that is very, very critical as far as the production of beef. And not only beef, but competitive beef is, uh, uh, is, um, is, is, is concerned. And uh, uh, the, the, the livestock farmers now are very uh, critical at this point because what it entails is that if there are no livestock farmers producing uh, animals that can go into the feedlots, then it means uh, uh, the feedlots cannot run. Because what we are doing uh, with feedlotting is we are not breeding the animals. So if there is not adequate animals coming from our farmers, then we can't talk of feedlots. We can't talk of aggregating the animals where if they are nowhere the animals are coming from. So I think uh, the farmers now become uh, the key players uh, of uh, or the key feeders of uh, feedlot business. If there are no livestock farmers, there are no uh, feedlots. And as a country, I think moving towards you know, improving the quantities of meat and even improving the quality of meat we we, we are producing. It's high time that uh, there is need to synchronize uh, or to make uh, the primary producers, livestock producers, aware of the expectations of uh, uh, the animals that fit uh, feedlot conditions. The challenges we often meet uh, in, in feedlotting is that uh, you are trying to buy animals, uh, certain animals uh, that give you better in the feedlots. But you go into the, uh, where our farmers are distributed, you can't get animals of such nature. Uh, for for instance, sometimes you know farmers uh, do not castrate uh, their animals. It's only probably after five, ten years, eight years they realize that this male animal is not fit as a breeding bull. Then at that point they want to sell it to the uh, for for fattening which is not proper because if it's a bull and castrated in old, you can't you know, improve significantly the quality of meat. Actually, the quality of meat from the bulls you now is not that good. And so, so I think we're at a point where our farmers generally just need to be aware of it. Uh, if I ever want to consider selling my animals for feedlotting, what, what are the expectations? So that they can start you know, managing the animals in a manner that... Uh, uh, it is to get uh, more value when the animals are, are threatened. So one thing is National Crow we've been trying to do is to bridge that gap where the generality of the livestock farmers are aware of the stages animals should go through and they are aware of the management practices that allow the animals to add more value when they are threatened. This is very important because uh, pain threatening, there is no rocket science. Even the normal, uh, you know, uh, livestock farmers in wherever they are, they are also able to do pen fattening on their own, uh, just taking the animals from their breeding heads and fattening. But then if the animals are not managed well from when they are born to a point where they are now ready to go for feedlotting, then everything else is uh, it's messed. So farmers are the critical players. And uh, what we are basically trying to do, we as National Crow, we're trying to complement our government efforts and other private players' efforts in ensuring that our farmers are producing good animals uh, that can, you know, fetch better prices when they are fattened and sold as um, uh, as beef. So it's also part of what we need to do as a country to improve our potential uh, to become a major uh, player in the in the global market. Often, time as a country we fail to access certain markets because of failing to meet the, their demands. Now, it is important, I think, to, to disseminate information to the farmers and to all players that uh, if we are to access certain markets, what are the expectations? What are the requirements? Nowadays, they talk of um, organic meat, which uh, the bulk of the meat we produce is largely organic meat because there is no this thing of using GMOs and stuff like that. But then we try to access certain markets of that nature. They want things like proper traceability information, recording, and so on. And oftentimes our farmers don't take animal recording as, uh, as something that's uh, serious. Recording of things like disease occurrence, the management, what the animals were being fed, 
uh, how the animals were managed generally. It's something that uh, our farmers should uh, actually uh, play to because it's some of these things that are that are now being considered when to access when you want to access certain uh, markets. Uh, so. Uh, information dissemination, I think, is basically very, very important. Our farmers need to be aware of the barriers into uh, accessing markets and how we can uh, circumvent or how we can deal with those barriers so that we can access uh, uh, these lucrative uh, markets. And also, one of the things I think um, uh, that that kind of uh, that's affecting our our potential is. Uh, some outbreaks of diseases uh some uh, our, our national head is not a, uh, sometimes it fluctuates going up and going down going up going down and so and in, as part of you know trying to address that we you would realize that uh, in our trainings as national crow every time we are having a training on pain fattening we also bring in the component of uh, good health uh, management of our animals animal health is very 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 important you would know that uh uh like foot and mouth is that one disease that's uh, you know affecting us in terms of being able to access certain markets and the challenge is that sometimes our farmers do not you know closely interact with the veterinary department services they see the veterinary sometimes as a threat to their animals because they see sometimes in the videos animals being banned and so but we are saying uh, when uh, we say probably there's an outbreak of a disease and you want to require to report to the nearest veterinary services, the idea is that they can quickly come in and offer you know, adequate assistance. You might lose little animal, but probably it's worth it because you save uh, the rest of the head. Uh, you would know that uh, we talk of genuine disease. It's been wreaking havoc throughout the country. And the government has been trying to do quite a lot in uh, to try and curb that disease and we are also into that space making our farmers aware of for the health management practices they should implement in their farms so that uh, the mortalities are not too 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 high so animal health management is that one area where a lot of efforts are needed uh, if we are to become uh, a major player in the in the in the beef uh, industry then faced with the drought, uh, we tend to lose quite a number of animals. Sometimes not only mortality, but uh, the shape or the body condition of our animals uh, it goes down during drought conditions because there are, there are no feeds. There is no feed. So it's time that uh, we need to be, our farmers need to try and explore innovating, innovative uh, feeding systems. Things like, you know, growing the, some legume for the crops, uh, irrigating the pastures, uh, making use of crop residues. These are some of the things that, uh, you know, that we can uh, do to ensure that we have adequate feed for, uh, for, for the animals. When we do not have adequate feed for the animals, normally our animals are in bad shape and even some animals will die. And it's that one major thing uh, that hinders us from becoming even uh, a critical pl a major player in the industry because uh, if we do not have enough feed, then the quality of the meat or the products we are producing then are also uh, poor. So in summary, I talk of animal health, uh, animal nutrition, uh, which are very, very, uh, very important. And also, we always say the profitability, if we are to become a major player uh, as a country, it means uh, the business must be viable, the business must be profitable. Uh, the, the the prices that our farmers are offered when they take their animals to the market must surely speak to the investment that sh that would have been put into the into the animals, and uh, it is one one area that uh, the government and the private players can try and work hard to link our farmers uh, to lucrative markets because if their animals are sold to lucrative markets, it means that our pockets are are full as, as farmers and when our pockets are, are full, are fed, it increases the capacity of, uh, to be able to, you know, to implement these good uh, management practices that even enable us to produce quantities uh, of better quality, uh, you know, animals. So marketing linkages, uh, sometimes uh, the primary producers of livestock, our farmers, they are not linked to lucrative markets. 
and it's a gap that needs to be bridged because the farmers need to have more money when the farmers have more money they are better able to manage the nutrition they are better able to manage uh, the health aspects they are also better able to you know to, to, to improve the general management uh, practices and the capacity for them to produce uh, uh, more animals actually increases. So it's, it's one of the, the, the critical areas that uh, needs to be addressed largely if we are to become a, a competitive uh, player in the, uh, in the, in the livestock um, industry. So uh, as a closing remarks uh, to this, uh, probably uh, this year is it's, it's an unfortunate year. It's too dry, you no know, rains. Uh, and it's, it's time that our farmers need to start looking at how they uh, bring in uh, the feed ingredients they can use to feed, to feed their animals, especially towards October. We talk of July, August, September. It's going to be very, very tough for most uh, our livestock farmers. And uh, like I said, one some of the things that can be done, our farmers need to know to normalize, you know, this talking. They need to normalize selling uh, the animals, especially like now. A farmer should be able to match the resources uh, he or she has, or the resources they can mobilize faces the number of animals they they have or they can manage. So your feed resources must match the animals you have. If you see that you have a lot of animals that cannot be supported by the resources, you can mobilize or you have. It's better, it's better off to sell the animals when they are still in good condition. Uh, normally what happens with most farmers, they only start selling the animals probably in August, September, after realizing that feed is already totally depleted and the animals are dying. And we are saying during then you won't be able to get as much as uh, from your as much from your animals you don't want to sell your animals under desperation um if you can finish fighting your animals now when the feed ingredients are still uh, uh there and uh, cheaply it's better time to to do it so our farmers need to seriously work on matching the animals they have to the feed resources they can bring uh, this makes our industry, you know, to remain uh, competitive. We are saying to the farmers, we don't want to see a situation where animals are just dying. A farmer has lots of animals; they cannot support the animals, and now the animals are uh, the animals are dying. So, uh, as part of you know, complementing the government efforts, like I've said in our trainings, we also trying to cover things like that where farmers must normalize. Uh, selling the animals we should continuously be matching the resources and the number of animals we have we don't want to see a situation where a farmer uh, loses animals and sometimes you move to zimbabwe you see a farmer who has 20 animals and they can't send a, maybe a child to school where the fees is only like hundred dollars so I think it's one thing that Zimbabwean farmers, especially our smallholder farmers, our communal farmers, need to normalize. We need to normalize selling our animals. Our animals is some form of wealth, it's value for money. And we only realize the money when we sell the animals. We don't want to see farmers selling the animals only when the animals are sick, only when the animal has died, or uh, only when the animals are now almost dying because there, there is no feed. So this is the time, and uh, like I said, one approach uh, to deal with this uh, drought, uh, negative effects of drought on our livestock is to explore pen fattening, where you buy feed, uh, you fatten your animals in confinement, and you take them to the market. As National Crow, we are aggressively you know, working out uh, uh, you know, management practices, especially with feedlotting, teaching farmers, training farmers throughout the country uh, on the, these pockets of the value chain that can be explored by farmers. Uh, and we have put it on our schedule that uh, this year, 2024, I think we are going to even put extra effort uh, to, to, to make our farmers, you know, normalize professional farming to improve in terms of their planning and also to improve in terms of their uh, management in general.